Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first recorded video lecture for Econ 2. Uh, again, we're going to be doing this class online this quarter in response to the coronavirus outbreak. So let's go ahead and get started here with our uh, very first lecture. Uh, so the way that this class is going to be organized is I've kind of set up this way of... Uh, keeping track of what we've covered and what we're going to cover and what I call climbing the macroeconomic mountain. A little while ago I got into mountain climbing, not entirely sure why, so I've kind of always organized my classes in this way. So the very first thing we're going to be covering is what is known as basic economics. Uh, just a quick note about how things are set up here at UC Riverside is that at some schools you have to take intro to micro before you take intro to macro. That's how it worked at my uh, alma mater of West Virginia University. And then at some schools you have to take intro to macro before you take intro to micro. So some schools you have to take one before the other. And the reason why they do that is they, so they, they know uh, who has taken what. So if you've taken, say, intro to macro at uh, one school, then you can go ahead and take intro to micro. So everybody taking intro to micro, we know that they've taken intro to macro. Now here at UC Riverside, it's a little unique in that you don't have to take one before the other. So you can take intro to macro first, or you can take intro to micro first, right? You can take either one first. There's no uh, uh, set requirement of having one as a prerequisite for the other. Now what that means is that about half the people in this class have taken intro to micro and half the people have not, right? So with that in mind, I'm going to go over the basic economics that you learn in an intro to micro class. Uh, as if nobody's taken it, just because, uh, again, half the people here have it, right? So if you've already taken Intro to Micro, these first three chapters called Basic Economics are going to be a bit of a review for you, right? If uh, you haven't taken it, don't worry. We're going to go over it as if you haven't taken it. So um, this uh, information will be covered in depth, right, so that you'll be uh, kind of on the same page as anybody who's already had Intro to Micro, right? Now, uh, I will try to keep it fresh and use different examples, those that kind of relate to macroeconomics more, so even if you all have already had this material, I would definitely uh, still watch these uh, videos and pay attention to these lectures because the examples are going to be different and the way that you learn the material might be at least slightly different. Right. After basic uh, economics, we're going to move into macroeconomic accounting. This is where we kind of get into the core macroeconomic stuff, right? And then we're going to get into uh, an introduction to basic macroeconomic mar markets. So this is going to be the kind of graphically intense chapter out of uh, all of them this quarter. And then we'll get into fiscal policy and monetary policy. So that's the plan of the attack for the entire quarter. Um, and hopefully by the end of the quarter, we will have covered all of these chapters. All right. So let's go ahead and get started here with basic economics, right? Starting with chapter one, the economic approach, right? So in this chapter, we're going to be uh, covering just some basic philosophy of uh, economics that kind of makes economists who they are. With that in mind, here's a quick overview for this chapter. You don't need to write any of this stuff down. This is just kind of a plan of attack for this chapter and this chapter only. Right, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over some basic terms and definitions. Right, so just some basic uh, ideas that you're going to need to know in order to understand what we're going to be talking about this quarter. And then the eight guide post-economic thinking are kind of the uh, eight pillars of thought that make the way the economists view the world a little bit different than the way maybe other people might view the world. Then we're going to go over the difference between positive and normative economics. And then finally, four pitfalls to avoid in economic thinking, or four logical mistakes you don't want to make when you're engaging in any kind of sound economic or logical reasoning. All right, so let's go ahead and get it started here with some basic terms and definitions. So what is economics? So economics is the study of how we make choices under scarcity. So again, economics is the study of how we make choices under scarcity. So what do we mean by choice? Well, choice is the act of selecting among alternatives. So right now you all are making a choice to listen to this lecture, right? Because you're making a choice to listen to this lecture, there's other things now that you can't do because you're spending that time listening to this lecture. So that brings us to this concept called scarcity, and that's the concept that there's less of a good freely available from nature than people would like. Right? So again, because you're listening to this lecture, there's other things you can't do because you have to make a choice as to whether you want to listen to this lecture or do something else, right? That's a result of the fact that uh, our time is scarce. There's not enough time to go around so that we can all do all the things that we like every day. So you have to make choices about what to do with our time. To give you an example of some other things that are scarce, right? Uh, here are a few. So tax revenue is scarce, right? Last year, the U.S. Uh, uh, federal government collected about uh, $3.46 trillion in tax revenue. 
And while $3.46 trillion sounds like a lot and is a lot of money, right, it's still a scarce amount of money and that the government has to make choices about what to do with that money. There's not enough money so they can do everything that they like, right? So you got to make choices. How much do they need to spend on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security? Um, how much are they going to spend on national defense? How much are they going to spend on, say, a stimulus package to help people uh, recover economically from this coronavirus outbreak? Right? These are all choices that the federal government needs to make with that limited amount of tax revenue. To give you an idea of how much money they spent last year, is about $4.4 trillion or nearly a trillion dollars more than what they took in in tax revenue. So they've added about a trillion dollars to our debt because they couldn't limit those choices to the amount of money that they collected. Education is another thing that's scarce. There's not enough education to go around so that everybody can have as much as they like. Certainly not freely available from nature. But that's why you all are spending so much money on your college tuition at UC Riverside. Right. Uh, there's a big debate politically now about whether or not the government should provide uh, uh, free tuition for public universities. Uh, as part of that debate, right, the idea is the government pays for your tuition versus you paying for that tuition. Right Now, again, the reason why we have this debate is because that tuition isn't freely available from nature, right? so it's uh, expensive for us to pay for it on our own. Right. In fact, to give you an idea of how expensive it is, if the government were to pr provide free tuition for everybody at a public university, that would cost about $79 billion. So that's about what people are paying for uh, on tuition at public universities right now. Right. Of course, food is scarce. There's not enough food to go around so that everybody can have as much as they want. To give you an idea, about 9.2% of the world is uh, what we call uh, suffers from what we call extreme food insecurity. You know, they do not have enough food uh, in their lives to uh, uh, satisfy their wants and desires, right? Uh, interestingly enough, I uh, recently looked this up, about 62% of UC Riverside undergraduate students claim to suffer from food insecurity. So even here at UC Riverside, students do not have as much food as they would like, and it's certainly not freely available from nature, which is why we have to pay for food. Right? So whether we're talking about tax revenue, education, food, or time, all of these things are scarce and that there's not enough to go around so that we can have as much as we like. So again, we have to make choices about what to do with our tax revenue. We have to make choices about whether or not to get this education. We have to make choices about uh, uh, how much food to get. Right? We have to make choices about how to spend our time. And the study of how we make these choices is what economics is all about. So everywhere you have scarcity, you pretty much have the study of economics. And, just, and scarcity applies to just about everything. So economics applies to just about everything. Some other things I want you to know about scarcity. Scarcity is not the same thing as poverty. Please don't confuse those two definitions, right? Um, something that uh, somebody who's considered, say, poor in the United States, right, wouldn't be considered poor in, say, a developing nation, right? Poor people in the United States usually still have things like uh, cell phones, uh, roof over their head, uh, internet access, uh, at least one or more cars, right, microwave oven, refrigerator, climate-controlled uh, shelters, Right, people who are living in, say, a developing country, uh, they might uh, hear that and say, well, how is that person considered poor? So, again, uh, it's different, right? It's, uh, poverty is a subjective term. It depends on where you live as to what's considered poor, whereas scarcity is more objective. It's always true. Right? Uh, poverty might also depend on what time period you're living in. So somebody, say, uh, uh, 50 years ago, who is considered middle class would be living in a, in a situation that they might be considered poor today, right? So what's considered poor now might not be considered poor, say, 50 or 100 years ago. However, scarcity exists both now as it did in the past in the same kind of way, right? So again, scarcity is more an objective term, whereas poverty is more subjective. Also, scarcity necessitates rationing. And rationing is just the allocating of scarce goods to those who want them. Because there's not enough freely available from nature so that everybody can have as much as they want, we got to decide who gets these scarce items, right? Who gets this limited amount of stuff, right? How do we spend this limited amount of tax revenue, right? Who gets this limited amount of food? Who gets this limited amount of education? In the 1970s, we had an oil embargo in this country that resulted in high uh, gas prices. And what the United States tried to do was put a limit on those gas prices or what are known as price ceilings in an effort to help Americans pay for gas. But if you don't allow that price to go up, then what that did end up causing was these long lines at the gas stations. 
And so we're allocating things not based on price, but based on first come, first serve. If you were uh, first at the gas station, you might be able to get gas. If you weren't first at the gas station, unfortunately, the gas station might run out of gas by the time your car got to the front of the line. In fact, as a uh, college student during the 1970s, you could actually make money as a job by waiting in people's cars while they went about their day in order to pull it up to the gas station and fill it up with gas because it would take about all day for you to get gas after waiting in line. So if you ration things based on first come, first serve, then you encourage people to wait in line, right? If you ration things based on, say, price, like we do in a market economy, then you encourage people to earn money. And uh, even though it's got plenty of flaws, right, rationing things based on price is considered more economically efficient and that encouraging people to earn money, you encourage them to work or be productive or provide people with goods and services. Whereas, again, rationing things based on, say, first come, first serve, you're encouraging people to wait in line, which is a less productive activity. So how you choose to ration these scarce items is going to influence how people behave in your economy. Another thing I want you to know about scarcity is that scarcity leads to competitive behavior. And in economics, competition can be a good thing. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, Charles Darwin's idea of natural selection. And that says that the species that are best able to adapt to their environment and reproduce, those are the species that are going to be most likely to survive. Right? Well, the same thing is kind of true when it comes to businesses competing with one another in our economy. Those businesses that are best able to keep their customers happy and their prices low and adapt to their current economic environment, those are the businesses that will be most likely to make profits and continue their way of doing things. Now, those businesses that can't keep their customers happy or can't keep their prices low, those are the businesses that are most likely going to go out of business and free up those scarce resources for those more competitive firms that are better able to adapt to their economic environment. So again, scarcity leads to competition, and usually when businesses compete, customers win. So it's a good thing that that competitive behavior is going on within our economy. So we're going to kind of segue a little bit from scarcity and start talking about another definition that's going to be important, and that is resources. Now, a resource in economics is an input used to produce an economic good. So it's any ingredient we use to produce something else. And there are all kinds of different resources out there or different kinds of resources out there, one of which is what we refer to as human resources or sometimes referred to as human capital. And human resources are those intangible qualities about us as human beings that we use to produce a good or service. So it could be our speed, our strength, our knowledge, our creativity, our ability to make a three-point shot, our ability to run really fast, swim very fast. It could be our ability to create uh, a world like the one that Harry Potter lives in, right? So J.K. Rowling's uh, knowledge or creativity when it comes to writing books could be an example of a human resource. Physical resources are man-made tools and machines. So you can think of it as like a chainsaw or a hammer or nails or lumber. These are all uh, man-made tools and machines that we use to produce other items. So again, we could call these uh, physical resources or physical capital. And then natural resources come to us from nature in their current state. So you can think of something like coal or iron ore or natural gas. These are all examples of natural resources. Now, notice that human resources and physical resources are called human capital and physical capital, respectively, but natural resources are not referred to as natural capital. In order to be called capital, you have to have uh, some kind of uh, a human alteration to the particular uh, resource in question. So, for example, we can develop our speed, strength, and creativity as human beings. We can do things like uh, create or develop hammers, nails, and chainsaws. Right, but we don't develop those natural resources, right? And, uh, they come to us from nature like that, right? So when we talk about capital, we're talking about any human made resources used to produce other goods and services, right? Uh, and so natural resources does, does, do not necessarily fall into that particular category, right? So now that we've got those basic terms and definitions out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the economic way of thinking, which is probably one of my favorite parts of the course. So we're going to get into kind of the philosophy that makes economists see the world a little bit differently than maybe how other non-economists uh, would see the world. And when you look at the world this way, you got to be very careful. Things are not always as they appear. In other words, they may look like uh, uh, things may look to be a certain way, but then turn out to be something completely different when you're using uh, the economic way of thinking. But we're looking at the world through an economic lens. 
So let's get into the economic way of thinking with uh, the very first guide poster element of economic thinking, which is one that we've kind of already highlighted or talked about. And that is that resources are scarce, so decision makers must make trade-offs. Or the way that economists often abbreviate this one is they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't get a lunch that's already paid for or free to you. What this means is that uh, you can't get a lunch that is free to society, meaning that somebody somewhere along the line had to pay for it, and that all the resources that were used to make that lunch are resources that can't be used for anything else. Right? So whenever you make a certain choice or course of action, right, then that means that there's a, another choice or course of action that you can no longer do, and the highest value foregone uh, alternative, or the thing that you value most that you can no longer do, is what we call the opportunity cost of that particular choice or course of action. So again, the official definition of opportunity cost is that is the highest valued alternative that must be sacrificed when choosing an option. Right? So again, it's the highest valued alternative that must be sacrificed when choosing an option. It's a very important uh, definition in economics. So when you're making the choice to say, spend an hour or so watching these video lectures and take, taking notes, then that's an hour that you can't spend doing something else. Right, whatever your most uh, highly valued alternative is, right, that's the opportunity cost of spending this time taking these notes and listening to this lecture. So if, you mo if you'd uh, rather be, say, binge watching Netflix right now, that would be the opportunity cost of listening to this particular uh, one hour of lecture. Right. So in macroeconomics, the typical trade-off that we usually talk about is what we, is what we refer to as guns and butter, or the trade-off between, say, military spending versus social spending. So again, the government does have a limited amount of tax revenue, and every dollar of that tax revenue that they spend on, say, national defense or military spending is a dollar that they can't spend on things like education or welfare or social spending, right? So there's an opportunity cost to those tax dollars. Again, just because the government provides it doesn't mean that it is free to society, right? In order for the government to provide it, it has to collect that money in taxes, and any money that that government spends in taxes on one thing is money that it can't spend on something else. So let's get into the idea of the opportunity cost of some government programs. So the government has kind of created some controversy with its endorsement of what's called the F-35 fighter jet project, which is a uh, new, more advanced fighter jet the, uh, that has an estimated cost of $1.45 trillion for the entire project. So to give you an idea of what the opportunity cost of $1.45 trillion is, we're talking about what could you do with that money if you weren't spending it on the fighter jet project. If you weren't spending that $1.45 trillion on the fighter jet project, you could do any one of the following with that amount of money. Uh, you could uh, have the government pay for public college tuition for nearly every student for the next 20 years. So we talked about the debate of uh, whether or not the government should pay for people's college tuition. Right. Again, that's going to cost about seventy nine billion dollars. Right. Well, with one point four five trillion dollars, you could pay that tab for the next 20 years. You could also nearly wipe out all student loan debt for every American, which is currently standing at just under one point six trillion. So you can nearly wipe out all student loan debt with that one point four five trillion dollars if you didn't spend it on the F-35 fighter jet project. You can also cover everyone's health insurance premiums for the next four years, so nobody would have to pay health insurance in this country. Again, something that kind of gets debated about in politics uh, quite frequently. You can cover the estimated damage of 14 major natural disasters with that amount of money. Of course, that's an estimate because it depends on the size and severity of that natural disaster. You could just cut a check for $4,500 for every American with that uh, same amount of money. Or my personal favorite, you could hire Beyonce to play one show every night for the next thousand years, at least theoretically, with that amount of money. Uh, to give you another uh, potential government project that's been thrown about in the media recently, uh, the, is the, there's the Green New Deal policy proposal, which the idea behind this is to get the, country, uh, the entire country running on 100% um, green energy uh, within the next uh, 10 to 20 years or so. And the estimated cost of this project is somewhere between 51 and 93 trillion dollars. It's kind of hard to estimate the cost because the project itself is kind of vague and uh, what it plans to do and how it plans to do it. But even at the minimum cost of that 51 trillion dollars, 
right? The uh, for that amount of money, you could give every American one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. So every man, woman, and child in the United States could receive one hundred fifty five thousand dollars. That could be the opportunity cost of that fifty one trillion dollars. So again, opportunity cost is what you'd most rather do with that money if you weren't spending it on this current project. And there's quite a bit of debate about what the government should be doing with that money. Um, so again, the opportunity cost of government programs is a good place to start when looking at this particular concept, particularly in macroeconomics. So let's get into the next guide, post-economic thinking. It's one of my favorite, and that is that individuals are rational, or they try to get the most from their limited resources. And what we mean by this is that people try to get the greatest benefit at the least possible cost. So if two things cost the same, right, then you're going to choose the one that's going to make you the most happy. If two things make you equally happy but cost different amounts, then you're going to choose the one that's cheaper. You're always going to try to get the greatest benefit at the least possible cost. A joke I always make with students is that I can tell exactly what you're thinking when you're going through the syllabus on the first week of classes. You're usually thinking, what's the least amount of work I can do and still get an A in the class? And economists would say it's perfectly rational for you to think like that because if you can do less work in this class and still get an A, then that frees up more time to do more work and get better grades in other classes or maybe work more in order to make more money or spend more time with your friends, enjoying your leisure time. Right? Again, you're going to try to get the greatest benefit at the least possible cost or essentially try to get the most out of your life. That's kind of what economics is all about. So I was recently part of a pretty intense debate about which was better, the In-N-Out Burger versus the Five Guys Burger, which I really think is kind of a West Coast versus East Coast thing. My friends on the West Coast like to think that the In-N-Out Burger is better. My friends on the East Coast like to think that the Five Guys Burger is better. Um, but the idea here is that some people might prefer the In-N-Out Burger. Other people might prefer the Five Guys Burger. There really is no right answer here. Right? So what's rational for one person may not necessarily be rational for somebody else because preferences are subjective or different. In other words, one person could look at these two burgers and say, I prefer the In-N-Out burger, and they'd be considered rational in making that statement. Some, uh, somebody else could be looking at these two different burgers and say, I prefer the Five Guys burger, and they'd be rational in making that statement. They actually asked me to be an official judge to settle the debate, and my conclusion was that I prefer the Five Guys burger over the In-N-Out burger, all things constant or equal, but I did note that they were different prices. In other words, the In-N-Out burger is a little cheaper than the Five Guys burger. And if you're talking about the best burger for the price, then I think it switches to In-N-Out because it is the cheaper burger. But again, preferences are subjective. You can make a, you can have your own opinion here, and nobody's opinion is really considered wrong. Right? And the same thing is true when it comes to these political debates. Some people prefer maybe a universal health care system where the government will uh, use taxpayer dollars to pay for everybody's health care. Some people might prefer over that, that free college tuition that we just talked about where the government uses taxpayer dollars to pay people's uh, tuition bills. Some people might prefer to have lower taxes over either of those, saying, hey, if the government's going to be providing health care or free tuition or free college tuition, then they're going to have to raise our taxes. I prefer to hold on to my money and spend it on what I want to spend it on rather than on universal health care or that college tuition for other people. So again, you can prefer any one of those three and not necessarily be wrong because preferences are subjective. So what's rational for one person isn't necessarily going to be considered rational for everyone. We can make different choices and still all be considered rational based off of the fact that preferences or values are subjective. So I'll give you an idea of kind of how we can make these different choices but still be considered rational. So a uh, quick story from uh, my past is I used to do a lot of boxing when I was in high school. And then when I was in college, I used to box with the campus police department. And the campus police officers at West Virginia University used to carry uh, pepper spray. And as part of their training to carry pepper spray, they would actually have to take a blast of pepper spray to the face. So they gain an appreciation for it and just wouldn't be uh, pepper spraying students all over the place for the fun of it. So I was uh, boxing with uh, some of these uh, campus police officers, and it was the day of their pepper spray training. And they're like, hey, Joel, do you want to stay and do the pepper spray training with us? And I was like, do I? Absolutely. Let's try it, uh, let's try it out. And so they sprayed some pepper spray in my face, and you have to sit there and pretty much just take the pain for about 15 to 20 minutes. And it does hurt a lot, right? It's like the devil came up and slapped you. And um, the idea here is that I kind of just want to see what it felt like. 
And that was rational for and that's a rational decision for me to make because the benefits of satisfying that curiosity of seeing what pepper spray felt like outweighed the cost of the pain of being pepper sprayed itself, which is a rational decision for me to make, but maybe not necessarily a rational decision for other people to make. In other words, you could be faced with that uh, same uh, option of choosing to get pepper sprayed and say, ah, no thanks, it's not for me, and you'd be considered equally rational. All right, so the fact that I chose to be pepper sprayed while you may choose not to be pepper sprayed doesn't make either one of us wrong or irrational, just different. All right, I look at the fact that we can make these different choices as an uh, opportunity to celebrate our diversity rather than a uh, opportunity to condemn one another just for being different. Right. With that in mind, politics works kind of in a similar fashion. Right. Some people in the last election voted for Donald Trump. Other people voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, and again, both could be considered rational because those politicians represented the preferences that they held uh, important to them. Right. So a lot of times people who are on the conservative or Republican side of things will condemn Democrats. Sometimes people on the Democratic or liberal side of things will condemn Republicans as being wrong, uh, when in reality, again, they just have different uh, subjective preferences. Uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about uh, politics in this class uh, as part of our kind of uh, economic analysis of how people make decisions. In case you're wondering, I am not a Democrat, and I've never voted for a Democrat in my entire life. I'm also not a Republican. I've never voted for a Republican in my entire life. Uh, I'm an economist, which means that there's some issues that I may be more liberal about. There's other issues that I may be more conservative about, but I'm neither a uh, Democrat or a Republican. The more you study economics, the more you realize that both sides of the political spectrum are pretty economically inefficient, just in different ways. And uh, just so you know, the only thing that I, I care about less than my political affiliation is your political affiliation. So whenever we talk about a policy, I'll make sure to give you both sides of the uh, policy so that you can uh, decide for yourself uh, which policy is best and why. So let's go ahead and move on into our third guidepost or element to economic thinking. And that is that incentives matter or choices influenced in a predictable way by changing incentives. So the idea behind this one is that the uh, benefits of an action increases, more people are going to be willing to undergo that action. But if the cost of an action increases, then fewer people are going to be willing to undergo that action. For example, during this coronavirus outbreak, the benefit of owning and using hand sanitizer has increased. So you see a lot more people out there buying hand sanitizer to the point where it's pretty difficult to find in stores these days. So again, as the benefit of owning hand sanitizer increases, you're going to see more people going out there and buying it. Now, when we get to chapter three, we're going to be talking a lot about supply and demand and that supply and demand graph, which sometimes gives students trouble. But whenever you're struggling with that, I want you to think back to this element or guidepost economic thinking that people respond to incentives in a predictable way. Because that supply and demand graph just demonstrates how people respond to price changes, which is kind of what this element is all about. So as the price of the good or service that you are producing and selling increases, you're willing to produce and sell more of that good or service. Again, that's just you responding to incentives as a producer. If the benefit of what you're producing and selling increases because you get a higher price for producing and selling it, then you're going to produce and sell more of it. And if the price of the good that you're buying increases, then you're going to buy less of it. Again, that's just you for, as a buyer responding to these price changes. So as the cost of the item that you're buying increases, then you're going to purchase less of it. So again, that supply and demand graph is just how people respond to changes in prices. And that's just, again, how people respond to changes in incentives. To talk a little bit about how people respond to changes and in incentives in a way that, again, we should be able to predict, but maybe don't always uh, accurately predict, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a quick story from my childhood. So my father, grew, uh, believe it or not, was a bullfighter. That was his profession for a long period of time. All right? But then after he married my mom and started having us, um, my brother, myself, and my sister, right, he ended up running a produce warehouse that I used to work at. And whenever he uh, ran this produce warehouse and I uh, would work there as a kid, I would notice that whenever some of the produce went bad, like if uh, a supply or shipment of apples went bad, then I noticed that he would give those apples to a charity group, like a group of nuns who would make apple butter out of it and then sell that apple butter. And I used to ask him, I said, hey, you have so many workers here who uh, could really benefit from some of these apples. When they go bad, how come you don't give them to your workers? And then he told me a story that I'll never forget. 
He says, when I was a bullfighter back in Mexico, I used to work on a ranch so that I could uh, learn how these bulls uh, moved and, and kind of uh, get more familiar with the animal. I was working at this ranch. I noticed that whenever a bull would break its leg and it was too late to send the meat to the market, the owner of the ranch would just throw the meat away. And I asked him this, a similar kind of question that you just asked me. I asked him, hey, when one of these bulls breaks its leg and you can't send the meat to the market, how come you don't give the meat to these poor workers who could certainly use it? And the rancher told me, well, what do you think would happen if every time a bull broke its leg, I gave the meat to the workers? Well, you'd see broken legs all over the place, right? Um, so you create this perverse incentive for these bull, for these workers to break these bull's legs uh, when uh, they certainly aren't supposed to. He said the same thing would happen if every time a uh, shipment of apples went bad, I gave those apples to the workers. You'd see apples go bad all over the place as workers would leave them outside the cooler or wouldn't take care of them properly. So you got to be very careful about the incentives that you're creating. Again, this is something that we could predict if we analyze the story closely enough. But if we don't analyze the story closely enough, then we might end up creating some incentives that we certainly don't intend to. So again, be very careful about the kinds of incentives you create with the policies that you enact. And just be aware that sometimes you could create some uh, unintended consequences or perverse incentives that can lead to some uh, behavior that you certainly don't want to see happening. All right, so this is going to bring us to our fourth guidepost economic thinking, which is the last one we're going to talk about here in this uh, part one lecture video. So the fourth one is that individuals make decisions at the margin. When we say that individuals make decisions at the margin, when we talk about the word marginal in economics, we're describing the effect of a change in the current situation. So say comparing two options or going from the current situation to a new situation, what is that change all right, that's what we call the, um, the, the marginal uh, cost or marginal benefit. So the marginal cost is the change in the bad things that happen when you go from the current situation to the new situation. And the marginal benefit is the change in the good things that happen when you go from the current situation to a uh, new situation. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about how to calculate marginal costs and benefits. So let's go through a quick example of a dinner out with friends. So let's say that you and your two closest friends all go to dinner and you decide to split the bill evenly, right? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, do this example mathematically using the stylus, which means I got to write on my laptop screen so it could get a little messy, but we're going to do the best we can. So imagine that you have two options. Option A is a $12 meal. And then option B is a $15 meal. And you have to choose between those two options. Now, you and your friends agree ahead of time to go ahead and split the bill evenly, which means that whichever option you choose, right, that cost of that option gets divided up among you and your two closest friends, which means that if you choose option A, that $12 dinner is going to be divided up across all three of you, you and your two closest friends, so that's going to come out to $4 per person. Now, if you were to choose option B, which is the $15 meal, then that $15 meal again would be split three ways, which is going to come out to $5 per person. So if you're asking how much does choosing option B add to my personal costs over choosing option A, right? the correct answer is just the difference in how much that's going to affect the amount of money that's leaving your wallet, which in this case is just $1. Right? So the marginal cost of choosing option B over choosing option A to you is $1, even though that meal is $3 more expensive because it's being split over three people. Right. So if you value option B over option A in terms of the uh, uh, benefit of that meal as anything more than one dollar, then you're probably going to choose option B over option A just because it's only going to cost you one additional dollar to choose that uh, option B meal. Right. So with that in mind, if you're going to agree to split the meal uh, evenly across you and your friends, you might be more inclined to choose a more expensive meal because, again, the marginal cost to you is going to be lower than if you had to pay for that meal yourself. Right. So looking at that logic, let's take a look at how this is going to affect decisions made at, say, the national level when it comes to government policy. So let's say that the state of California wants a tattoo removal program that is funded by the government. 
let's say the cost of that tattoo removal program is $200,000. So $200,000 to help people remove their tattoos. Now, you and you alone would probably be unwilling to pay $200,000 in taxes just so that uh, a bunch of people can get their tattoos removed. But if we can split that cost over all the taxpayers in California, it's just going to be a low cost to you, so you might be more in favor of that policy then. But what if we could split that cost over all the taxpayers in the United States? So in other words, we collect taxes from everybody in the United States, and then we use those taxes to remove tattoos here in California. Well, the state of California is going to be very much in favor of this policy because it's going to, uh, again, help people in California, but then people from all over the country are going to help pay for it. So the same way that you might be more inclined to choose an expensive meal when your friends are going to help you pay for it by splitting that bill evenly, right? the state of California is going to be more in favor of a tattoo removal program if they get federal funding for it because it means that the other 49 states are going to help them pay for it. Right? So a lot of times policies will get passed when maybe the state itself wouldn't be willing to pay for it if they get the entire country to help them pay for it, right? which is one reason why the government might end up spending a lot more tax revenue that it ends up uh, taking in and adding to that uh, national debt, right? So when we decide whether or not to uh, engage in a particular action, we usually want to compare the marginal benefits versus the marginal costs of that action. If the marginal benefits outweigh the marginal costs, then we say this is an action you want to undergo. If the marginal costs outweigh the marginal benefits, then we say that this might be an action that you don't want to undergo or an action that you might want to avoid. So let's go ahead and uh, look at an example of calculating marginal costs and marginal benefits, uh, something that's very appropriate to the time period we're living in. Let's take a look at the costs and benefits of social distancing during this coronavirus outbreak. Now, these numbers are our uh, best estimates, so I'm not going to say these numbers are completely accurate because they are based on the estimates of both uh, economists and healthcare professionals. But let's go ahead and engage in this cost-benefit analysis. So when it comes to social distancing, right, there are benefits in terms of saving lives, but it is going to lower our production as an economy since nobody can work or interact together. Right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what the uh, would happen when we don't engage in social distancing. So this is non-social distancing. So this would be like if we went about our life as we normally would. Right, we're going to work, we're going to school, we're not uh, taking these classes online, we're not keeping uh, four to six feet away from each other, right? We're just going about life as we normally would, right? If we did that, the number of deaths estimated from the coronavirus in the United States over the course of a year could be as high as 2.2 million, according to healthcare experts. However, the estimated uh, GDP or production of the economy, the GDP is something that we're going to talk about in a lot more detail in Chapter 7, but just for now, know that it's the total measure of economic activity in the economy over, say, the course of a year. Well, the annual GDP for 2020 would be estimated to be about $22 trillion. So of course, now we are engaging in the social distancing, which means that we are staying home from school and work and taking classes online and shutting down businesses and things like that. So when it comes to that social distancing, how many lives will that save? Well, it's estimated about 600,000 lives will be saved due to social distancing. So the number of deaths here would be about 1.6 million as a result of the coronavirus in the case of social distancing as compared to the 2.2 million de uh, deaths when we don't engage in social distancing. The social distancing is estimated to cost us about 30% of our GDP, or in other words, our GDP as a result of social distancing over the course of this year might just be 15.4 trillion dollars. So that will be the total measure of economic activity, right, if we do engage in social distancing for the entire year. Right, so when it comes to whether or not we should engage in social distancing, we need to compare the costs and the benefits. So 
Should we keep engaging in social distancing? Well, what is the marginal benefit of engaging in social distancing? You got to compare the lives saved with social distancing versus the lives uh, that would be lost if that social distancing wasn't happening. Right again, without social distancing, right then we have uh, 2.2 million deaths. With social distancing, we only have 1.6 million. So again, we have about 600,000 lives that are saved with social distancing. So that's the marginal benefit of social distancing is that 600,000 lives, right? But what is the marginal cost of social distancing? What is it going to cost us in terms of the uh, economic production that we're going to lose as a result of all of us being quarantined at home and not going to work or school anymore? And again, that's estimated to be about 30% of GDP, which in this case is about 6.6 trillion dollars that's going to be lost, lost as a result of uh, these social distancing measures. So now the real question is, is it worth $6.6 .6 trillion in order to save 600,000 lives? Right Now, this is kind of more of a subjective question. It depends on how much you value life. But basically what this comes down to is a price of $11 million per life. So if you think it is worth $11 million to save you, uh, each life, then you would say that social distancing would be worth it, right? If you think that it might be uh, too expensive to spend $11 million to save each life, right, then you might be against these social distancing measures, right? Again, whether or not it's worth it is kind of a subjective call, right? But I will say this, that $11 million per life is pretty costly. You can definitely save a lot more lives for a lot less, right? For example, for a... Uh, pretty small fee of uh, $879, you can not only uh, feed, clothe, and provide uh, shelter uh, for a child in Africa, but you can also provide them education for the entire year. So with that in mind, you could use that same $6.6 .6 trillion to um, uh, feed, clothe, provide shelter, and educate about 7.5 billion African children. So is it worth uh, $6.6 .6 trillion to save 600,000 lives? Well, again, that's kind of a subjective question. What's the opportunity cost of that $6.6 .6 trillion? Well, again, it could be not only saving the life of, but educating 7.5 billion African children, in which case it might be worth it to use that money for something else. In other words, if we didn't engage in those social distancing measures and then we actually got that $22 trillion worth of GDP and then donated $6.6 .6 trillion of it to other causes, could we save even more lives then, right? So, that's, so we talk about things like opportunity costs and the best use of our money and getting the most out of our scarce resources. And sometimes it involves making tough choices like this, right? But this is kind of how an economist would uh, look at these, these kinds of questions. And so that's a good uh, explanation there of cost-benefit analysis, where you're going to be able to calculate the marginal benefits, right? Again, what's the uh, extra good things that's happening with social distancing? Well, that's the saving of lives versus the marginal cost. What are the extra bad things that are happening with social distancing? Well, again, that's the cost of the economy in form of less production. And then again, is it worth it? Well, you got to compare the marginal benefits versus the marginal cost. And again, never lose sight on the opportunity cost of what could be done with that $6.6 .6 trillion. Could that be used to save even more lives or help more people elsewhere? In which case, again, you need to factor that into whether or not it's worth it. Okay. So that is it for this particular uh, uh, lecture here. We're gonna go ahead and stop here and pick it up uh, uh, with guidepost number five when we get into part two of this lecture uh, in our next video. So I hope you all enjoyed this first one. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be available through those Zoom office hours, or of course, you are always welcome to email me or even call me on my cell phone if you prefer, right? Uh, again, I hope you all enjoyed this lecture, and I will see you all next time. Have a good one. Stay safe and stay healthy.